another relatively new faculty member here, although not as new as Gary, is Mary Leonard. Mary is a professor of pediatrics and medicine, and she's also been appointed as the associate dean for maternal child health research, and she co-leads Spectrum's child health at Stanford. Um, she's a pediatric nephrologist and directs the Bone and Health and Nutrition Research Center, where she studies the impact of childhood chronic illnesses and chronic diseases on, on bone health and muscle function across the life course. Now, Mary was a medical student at Stanford. I know that because we were in, similar, in the same classes. Um, and then she went for a, a period of time off to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and University of Pennsylvania. So we're very excited to have Mary back on the farm. Good afternoon. So thank you, Tom, for that very nice introduction, and a special thanks to Dennis for this remarkable symposium and the opportunity to participate. So I'm hoping this presentation will close the loop. We started out with the arc from fetal to adult development, and we've heard some things about remarkable uh, advances in the care of children with com com complex chronic disease. But now, because of these advances, we have to turn our attention to some of their outcomes in adulthood. So there's many different ways of capturing the life course paradigm. This is yet another figure. You've heard about trajectories. You've heard about the health ecosystem, risk factors, protective factors, and you, all the things we heard about Don and what his group and what many people have been tackling uh, is captured in this notion here that our job as pediatricians is to send children on the optimal trajectory to peak health development, to minimize risk factors, to implement protective factors, with the hope that with the inexorable decline with aging, they won't drop below the point that they become symptomatic. But you can also apply this paradigm to chronic diseases. And I think this figure illustrates why bone health is in many ways the poster child for the life course development. A child accrues 40% of your bone mass just in those few years around pu uh, puberty. It's a, rare, a very important window of opportunity for us to implement strategies to promote bone health but we're concerned it's a window of vulnerability to our children with chronic disease. So we try to optimize peak bone mass, and then with that decline with aging, symptomatic, of course, would be considered osteoporotic fractures, but unfortunately, we're starting to see really what is characterized as osteoporotic fractures in children and adolescents. So the NIH held an osteoporosis consensus conference back in 2000, and one of their leading conclusions is that um, one of the most important strategies is to optimize peak bone mass. And you can see this campaign um, by many different uh, governmental agencies, including CDC and the United States Department of Health and Human Services, worked on educating our, our community about the importance of calcium and physical activity. And Dr. Green, yesterday, when he showed you the picture of, the, of a paper roadmap, uses the example of building bones to last a lifetime. So I mentioned a window of opportunity, and this is such a nice example and echoes back to what Tom said about everything that happens outside the skin. So when we think about um, factors that affect bone development, we have things like genetics um, and then and physical activity, and we've learned so much about how important physical activity is from the model of racket sports players because the genetics, the nutrition, uh, the vitamin D levels are the same in your left arm and in your right arm. But in these racket sport players, um, depending on how much you expose the bone to biomechanical loading, this is the model for physical activity, you can get big differences in the side-to-side -side bone mineral content. So in those racket players, those girls who played prior to puberty, they have a substantially bigger bone. And so again, uh, thinking about chronic disease, we're worried about what's happening during that window of vulnerability. So here's the face of osteoporosis, right? A little old lady who's hunched over. Um, and people don't think of osteoporosis as a pediatric disease, but unfortunately, I just saw a patient this week, a bone marrow transplant patient, who had such severe kyphosis and back pain that we asked him to get lateral spine films to look for compression fractures. And in fact, in a study in bone marrow transplant patients, just as an incidental finding, we found that 14 out of 25 who were enrolled in a study had these very same types of compression fractures. So certainly, certainly a, a poor harbinger. All right, so what are the threats to bone accrual during childhood? We talk, I'm talking about risk factors. Um, really, here is a list, and no matter what you, uh, any physician specializes in, you're gonna, I think some of this will resonate with you um, in that so many of these childhood chronic diseases have these risk factors. Malnutrition and malabsorption, for instance, inflammatory bowel disease, we heard from our very first speaker how inflammatory bowel disease is on the rise. Um, immobility and muscle deficit, certainly the extreme would be a child with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy, but we know that any of our children with chronic disease are less physically active, and you'll hear more about muscle deficit. 
obesity. Um, not only are there risk factors for poor bone accrual with obesity, but we're learning just in recent years that it's not just how much fat you have, but where that fat is. So you know the apple versus the pear, right? The apple with central obesity. Actually, that central obesity is a risk factor for poor bone accrual. Growth failure and delayed puberty in many diseases, and then our therapies. Prednisone is used in practically every subspecialty. It's a cornerstone of therapy for many diseases. We know it's the leading cause of secondary osteoporosis in adults. Um, we have a growing awareness of things like radiation therapy really poisons the bone forming cells. And then again, um, probably the biggest risk factor in our studies has been inflammatory cytokines that kill the bone forming cells and upregulate the cells that resorb bone. On the right is a picture of my tibia, scanned by high resolution peripheral quantitative CT. It's a device we just acquired here, and you can see it's a very powerful tool at looking at how the bone develops. And working with physicists, we're not only able to quantify things like the trabecular microarchitecture, but with repeated scans to track how an individual trabeculae moves through uh, development. So we've applied these sort of tools to many different diseases, and I've just listed the ones here where we've seen uh, the greatest cause for concern. So just some of the things we've looked at is using CT of the calf. You can see the child with inflammatory bowel disease has a smaller bone, and we think that once you're done growing, that's the bone you're going to have for your lifespan, and that's irreversible. Um, we also look at how much force, uh, muscle is part of this um, presentation. Again, thinking about the biomechanical loading, the fact that the skeleton is so responsive to muscle forces. And so we measure not just how much muscle you have with this whole body DEXA where the lean mass is orange and we can measure your muscle mass, but just, just recently we've appreciated it's not enough to look at how much muscle you have, but what's the quality of that muscle? So kids with inflammatory bowel disease, children with chronic kidney disease cannot generate as much force relative to how much muscle they have. So it's not just the amount of your muscle or the amount of your fat, but the quality of it. Um, and so I'm going to, now moving forward, I'm going to focus on chronic kidney disease and kidney transplantation, not just because I'm a pediatric nephrologist, but there's some special concerns with this group. Stanford's really pioneered kidney transplant uh, in children, especially in the younger children. But unfortunately, we're learning that when you transplant them, their bones don't recover. We would have hoped, you know, res restoring renal function um, would give, you, give us improvements, but their muscle, although their muscle mass improves, it generates poor force, their bones are small, they don't get bigger, um, and so um, lots of concerns. Now, I had an orthopedic surgeon say to me, well, so if, so if they fracture, you throw a cast on them, they're back, you know, they're back out to activities um, shortly, but it's very different. And children with chronic kidney disease who become, uh, you know, this is, these are lifelong diseases, become adults with chronic kidney disease. We know young adults on dialysis who had their kidney failure onset prior or during childhood have a many-fold increased risk of hip fractures. We know dialysis patients with hip fractures have mortality rates double the population based on hip fractures, um, and that uh, it, having a hip fracture in dialysis is more deadly than having cardiovascular disease. So these are really very clinically relevant um, events. These are not children or people who go on to develop osteoporosis maybe a little later, but really uh, or a little bit earlier in, as an elderly person, but, but actually as a young adult. So a little bit more about chronic kidney disease. First, let's talk about fractures across the lifespan just in the general population. So to the right is what we typically think of as the, the female predominance, the postmenopausal osteoporosis, and you can certainly see how the women pull away from the curve, although men do have osteoporotic fractures as well. But let's look at what's happening here. This is quite interesting. When people first began to realize that teenage boys had this big spike in fractures, the debate was, is that because your bones grow so fast in length as boys go through peak height velocity that it takes time for the bone to consolidate, it takes time for that bone to become strong. This study that we did using a population-based cohort of six million adults through the National Health System in the UK showed a couple different things that I think argue that it's not just of a developmental issue. Um, so for instance, this elevated fracture risk extends well into young adulthood. We repeated this curve where we limited it to skull fractures. It looks just the same. So I don't think this is a developmental issue. I think this is that some of our teenage boys are knuckleheads, um, and here we see them on the playing field with their casts. So, you know, th these are fractures. <laughs> this is from a website called castprotector.com. Um, so encouraging people to get back out there with their casts. So, so th but we needed to understand these relationships and then order to superimpose these um, patterns in children with chronic disease. So we did that. Um, this shows you just honing in on the child development, the fractures in boys and girls. And then I've shown you here, um, based on some national data, 
the fracture rates in children with chronic kidney disease. So you can see prior to puberty, significantly increased fractures. After puberty, our females compared to, fe compared to females and males compared to males really dramatically increased fracture. What's so much more remarkable about that is that this is in the context of very low physical activity. Um, so thinking about behavioral interventions and all we've heard about exercise, um, and this is how much, how many, the proportion of children nationally through the National Health Examination and Nutrition Survey and then children with chronic kidney disease who are adhering to the guidelines of less than two hours of screen time per day and physical activity um, as well. And not only do our children with chronic kidney disease have a sedentary lifestyle and high fracture risk, but when we took kidney transplant patients who were years out, who were doing well, who we would really hope were, were really thriving, and we did measures of VO2 max or cardiorespiratory fitness. They were quite abnormal, even if we adjusted for their poor muscle. So where are we exactly? We now suddenly realize we've got this population who's surviving into adulthood with kidney transplantation or bone marrow transplant, chronic, uh, childhood complex congenital heart disease. There are now more adults living with congenital heart disease than there are children. That's a whole new population, cystic fibrosis. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing is just to try to treat the underlying disease better. So we did a study looking at monoclonal antibodies that target TNF-alpha and showed that in these children um, with Crohn's disease, we got such remarkable recovery. So we can show now for the first time that this is, ir this is reversible if you get in when they're earlier in puberty. So they recovered. Um, but only if they were growing. That cortical bone could get bigger only if they were growing. Their trabecular architecture got better, but only before puberty. So we need to really think differently about how to treat these kids, maybe if they're to have a little bit different threshold for treating them with these therapies. But the other conclusion we've come, well, and then the other thing is to think about just getting bone and muscle on people's radar. So there's a very impressive, uh, big clinical trial that's about to be launched here in children with anorexia looking at different strategies for refeeding them, kids who require hospitalization. And we've come to them and said, you know, there's so much more to think about than just body weight. Of course, they knew that. So we're going to add things like quantitative CT and, find, and just add muscle and bone outcomes to some of our trials um, that are ongoing to see if they improve things. Or another trial that's about to launch here saying, should our diabetics be doing aerobic training or strength training to improve glycemic control? We're going to add muscle, bone, and fat to those outcomes. But I think what we've learned by looking at risk factors for things um, like bone and muscle deficits and chronic kidney disease and congenital heart disease, that really probably our best chance is to implement exercise trials. And that's daunting. And I think that's much harder than a trial with a drug. So we're going to have to look to people like Tom Robinson and really people who've pioneered exercise and lifestyle interventions in the community to help us figure out how to do these in our patients with chronic disease. I think that's really where the emphasis should be. Um, so with that, um, I'll finish um, just by acknowledging the, the really generous support we've had from many different places. Because bone and muscle cross so many different disciplines, we've been fortunate to have funding from many different institutes. Uh, for many different foundations, and a special thanks now for the support we have for the new Bone Center here and for Spectrum Child Health. Thank you.